Once again, we're going to briefly review this encounter like has been our practice during this series. We're going to dive into the story and look at it again so we can seize a couple of things that we might have missed the first time. That's the first thing we're going to do. The second thing is that we're going to slow down at a certain point in the story. We're going to slow down at the point in which this story takes, for me, a very surprising turn. And that's the place where we're really going to see the focus of the message this morning. And then finally, we're going to finish off by looking at the wider significance of the ending of this story, of how it ends and what it means. So let's take a look at this story again. The first thing I need you to understand in the way that Mark tells it and also Mark and Luke is that Jesus ends up here not by accident. It is with some intentionality that Jesus and his disciples end up on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. They are literally in another neighborhood. This is, again, to remind you, a non-Jewish community. They are in a region predominantly uh, inhabited by Gentiles. And we're not given anything more than the name of the region, the Gerasenes. We're not told the specific town that they come to, which is quite interesting. But it, what's also interesting is while the town, the village, is not specifically named, it's apparently known around the area because of the disruptive behavior of one of its own residents. And it's the, Mark takes us in and tells us about this man. And this man, we're told, has an impure spirit, which means he's demonically possessed. And based upon the description, what you heard, this guy terrifies everybody right? This, he's repeatedly cutting himself with stones. So you can imagine this guy is covered in bruises and in blood. The actual word that's used here is this idea that he's self-stoning. He's stoning himself. And when he's not physically abusing himself, this man is also described as howling all the time at the top of his lungs. We're also informed that the citizens brigade has tried previously to restrain this guy, but to no avail. He physically overpowers everyone else in the neighborhood. No one can stop him. And so this man wanders the countryside among the tombs of the city, the tombs of the city that were presumably carved from the caves that line the hills that rise up from the shore of the lake. And so you have this picture of this man, his endless and haunting shrieks reverberating throughout the community at all hours of the day. I mean, seriously, talk about your nightmare on Elm Street, right? It's this picture, this visual, you know, very sensory image that we're given to understand it's this shrieking, nearly naked man that races towards Jesus as he comes ashore, both scarred and scary as he's within inches of reaching Christ. Jesus rebukes the impure spirit and this guy suddenly drops to his knees, shouting as loudly as he can. This man questions Jesus and begs not to be tortured. Did you catch that? Don't torture me. But Jesus is not like the rest of this guy's neighbors. He doesn't shackle him or attack him or abuse this man. He simply asks a question. What's your name? And in this moment, Jesus isn't talking to the man. He's addressing the demonic force that is holding this man captive. And as this demonic force answers, we learn the truth of this man's bondage, right? He hasn't just been overtaken by an impure spirit. With the reply, my name is Legion, for we are many it's revealed that this man is being oppressed by a demonic army. A legion, particularly a Roman legion, was anywhere between 4,000 and 6,000 soldiers. So understand, inside this poor man is an entire army. His body, mind, and spirit have become enemy-occupied territory. I don't know if you caught it, if your Bible's still open, you can look at it, but notice in his exchange with Jesus, we hear this, this guy flip-flop between me and we as he talks. And the point of that, why I draw this out to you, is somewhere in there, buried beneath thousands upon thousands of hostile, invading voices, is a single, scared soul. You know, in the midst of getting into the, the thick of this, as a brief aside, let me comment on this whole idea of the demonic and spiritual warfare because it's always important when we read texts like these to just remind each other that there's two mistakes we can make when we hear about the demonic and spiritual warfare. One mistake we can make is to take it too lightly. You know, some of us can read stories like this and perceive that we're living in more enlightened times and we can dismiss this kind of stuff as being just super, this supernatural talk as being nothing more than superstition. We can, t can tell ourselves, well, that kind of stuff just doesn't exist anymore in this day and age. That's a mistake. My friends, if we believe in the goodness of God, then we must also believe in the reality of evil, which includes the demonic. So one mistake we can make is to hear a story like this and take it, not take it 
very seriously, take it kind of lightly. But the other mistake we can make when we encounter stories like these in the Bible is we can become obsessed and fearful of demons, right? Like seeing every hindrance or problem we encounter as some form of spiritual attack. But that's also not healthy. We can't and we shouldn't blame everything or even most things on the supernatural forces of evil. Much of the pain and suffering of this world is of our own making due to human sin and not demonic possession. So we gotta live in the middle here. And what's important when we read this story, when we hear it, what's essential not to miss is that the demons know who Jesus is, that he is the son of the most high God. What's important not to miss is they're afraid of him and that Jesus has absolute authority over them. There's no contest or battle of wills here. Jesus wins, it's game over from the moment he speaks. This legion of demons knowing they don't stand a chance against the power of the Lord, you heard them beg to be sent into some nearby pigs. And as he delivers this man, Jesus gives them permission to enter a herd of about 2,000 swine. And it's in that moment in this story that the purpose of demonic possession is made clear. It's made clear by what happens to the pigs. All 2,000 of them stampede down a steep bank into the lake and drown. The demons were bent on destruction and death for this man. And we see that through what happens to these pigs. But on, in contrast, on the other hand, Jesus reveals the aim of the kingdom of God as he delivers this man. This was a person who had become dehumanized. And when I use that term dehumanized, I define it this way. Dehumanization is the corruption or reversal of the dignity of a human being created in the image of God to enjoy life. This man has become dehumanized. Before meeting Jesus, this guy was battered and bleeding from self-abuse. He practiced self-mutilation, which is a form of self-destruction or self-hatred. He was perpetually screaming and wandering around because he was unable to control himself. He was secluded in his suffering, living outside the city, away from everyone else, in of all places, a graveyard. This man's existence was self-destructive, isolated, and miserable, not the kind of life at all for which he or any human being was created. And I remind us of this to then take a look at the picture that Mark paints for us after Jesus delivers him. On the other side of his deliverance by Jesus, Mark describes this man as being dressed in his right mind and calmly sitting at the feet of Jesus. And I, I zero in on this for a second because this is yet another beautiful picture of the gospel for us. When you think about the contrast, when you think about this image of this man dressed in his right mind and calmly sitting at the feet of Jesus, this is yet another picture of the gospel. More than just forgiveness, more than going to heaven when we die, the Bible consistently portrays the full impact of the gospel, what our God desires to give us as complete wholeness, the restoration of every aspect of our humanity, physical, spiritual, intellectual, emotional, and social. And this man is restored on each of these levels. He's spiritually released from demonic possession, which ends his physical self-harm, which restores control of his emotions. He's found in his right mind, and he's no longer alone, but he's engaged, ready to learn and follow as he sits at the feet of of Jesus. This beautiful picture of the gospel. And once again, as we've seen these last couple of weeks, same thing here, all of this, this man's deliverance and salvation, once again, has nothing to do with any merit on his part or earning of anything. This man brings nothing to Jesus. This man demonstrates no faith or proves himself trustworthy. His healing from his brokenness, his restoration from his isolation comes solely by the love and grace of Christ. This is the gospel. And you'd think as you continue to read this story, you know, you'd think as you're hearing it, right, with such a beautiful and revealing scene of the mercy of God, we would expect what comes next is celebration. In the coming to witness one of their own, right, their own fellow neighbor, a very broken man who had been made whole through the love of Christ, we would anticipate some cry of praise and thanksgiving. But this is where the story takes a very surprising turn. And this is the part where I told you we're going to really slow down. When the herdsmen of the pigs, the first witnesses of this man's deliverance, run back to tell everyone what happened, we're told the rest of the townspeople come to investigate for themselves. 
And as most of the community arrives on the scene and again sees their previously bad neighbor, right, sitting peacefully by Jesus' side, their collective response is shocking. I mean, really, it's a close call as to whether the people are more terrified by the violence of the demoniac or by the healing of the demoniac. Instead of being overjoyed by this man's deliverance, the people, we're told, are afraid and they ask Jesus to leave. We slow down because we want to ask why. Why are they so afraid? Why this reaction? Now, some who've looked at this story, some have argued their fear is the fear of loss, specifically economic loss. We sort of glossed over the incident with the pigs, but it's kind of a big deal. 2,000 pigs, 2,000 pigs, especially back then, represented a lot of money. For those who own the pigs, think about this, they just lost a significant part of their business. And for the community relying on what those pigs provided, their local economy has been negatively impacted as well. And so some argue that the reason for the fear is the fear of loss, economic loss. And I, we don't know, but if this is the reason, it's a ra rather sad commentary on this community that everyone in this town, think about this, cares more about the welfare of a bunch of swine than they do the healing and restoration of a fellow human being. But we slow down because this is the moment where we also realize these stories are a reflection for us. Do we see ourselves in this story? And what I'm asking, and I'm not saying that this is true, I'm asking, is it possibly true? Is it true in some segments? How often for us as a community, as a city, as a state, as a nation, how often for us even as a global community do economic concerns overshadow our action and our attention towards the well-being of others? How many of our neighbors are being dehumanized by living conditions or lack of basic resources that no one created in the image of God should be denied? How many? And yet, when there's talk of a tangible plan to help others, right? When there's talk to get people fully clothed, back in their right minds, integrated into society, when we talk about a plan to help those who are living on the streets, wandering outside our borders as refugees, or crying out in the darkness of addiction, when actual plans start to be put in place, how much louder and influential are the voices that insist? The cost of that kind of healing, the cost of that kind of restoration is too high a price to pay. We don't want our taxes to go up, right? We don't want our income potential or savings to be affected. We don't want our property values to go down. My friends, the gospel of Jesus Christ declares without exception, there can be no price put on compassion towards others. The way of the kingdom of God reveals a human life. Any and all human life is worth more, infinitely more than the bottom line of any balance sheet, any tax return, or our investment portfolio. If we're more afraid of losing money than we are of losing our neighbor, then our God is not Jesus. It is mammon. Some people say that the fear of this community is the fear of loss, economic loss. Others who've looked at this story say, no, no, the fear of this community is the fear of change. Because if you think about it, in healing this man, Jesus has just disrupted the social order of this community. What do I mean by that? Well, okay, sure, this guy was a disturbance to the neighborhood. He even, maybe even was a menace to society, but that was his part to play, right? I mean, he was the bad neighbor. That's his role, right? He was the one whom, who, who everything going wrong in the community could be blamed, that guy, in some bizarre, twisted way, this identified problem child was the glue for the rest of the village. Now, if what I'm saying right now doesn't make a lot of sense or sounds really far-fetched to you, consider this. Let's step aside for a second. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Alcoholics Anonymous, an important organization to help those who are in recovery. Do you know that the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous early on made a startling discovery? And it was this. They discovered that the healing of the alcoholic, the healing of the addict, did not, in fact, restore the family. It actually often destroyed it. They initially discovered, Alcoholics Anonymous, that the healing of the addict, the alcoholic, did not restore the family. It actually destroyed it. And you may say, well, why is that? 
Because what they discovered is everyone in the family had become dependent upon the alcohol as much as the alcoholic, him or herself. The point is that they learned is addiction affects the whole community. You see, addiction, when it takes place in an individual, shapes the family to relate to each other in a certain way. Specific roles suddenly become assumed when addiction strikes a community. And there's all different kind of names for these roles. A couple of examples. Someone becomes the enabler, the enabler in the community, making excuses for the addict, for the alcoholic. Another person becomes the family comedian. They're always trying to reduce the tension in the, in the, in the house and in the family through humor. And there's all these different roles that people play. It's not healthy, but it enables the family to function, to get through each day. Dysfunctionally. It's functional, but it's dysfunctional. And everyone gets used to it. That's how they cope. That's how they deal. That's how they relate. They get so used to it that when the alcoholic is healed, the rest of the family loses its way of relating to each other. This enormous vacuum created by the restoration of the addict, the alcoholic, is like a kind of withdrawal the whole community has to deal with. And in what AA came to realize is if an alcoholic stopped drinking and began to find healing, in most cases, the effects of this withdrawal that I just spoke of were so taxing on the rest of the community that the rest of the family would often try to push the alcoholic back into his or her old patterns of drinking. This is why, by the way, later support groups like Al-Anon and Alateen were formed, were established, because it was understood it was not just the alcoholic who was sick, who needed help, healing and restoration. It was the entire family, the entire community. In a similar way, if you've been with me, the heart of the Gadarene community is similarly exposed by Jesus. This man, their neighbor, was a troublemaker. No doubt they all regarded him as undesirable and dangerous, but they had their ways of dealing with him, didn't they? First, they repeatedly tried to bind him, to restrain this man, to keep him in his place, right? When this no longer proved a viable solution, they marginalized him. They segregated him, leaving him out among the tombs, sequestered and out of sight. It's the best they could come up with. And it kept this man in his place to serve his role as the scapegoat. Everyone else in the city had the privilege of then appearing to be even telling themselves how normal and how much more better off they were than him, than that guy. Each person could place all their demons, all their baggage on him. But then Jesus comes and heals this man. And in doing so, Jesus has destroyed their social order. Jesus has just now changed how this community is going to operate. No more locking people up, no more ostracism, no more segregation. With this guy no longer as their scapegoat, the dysfunction of the community as a whole is exposed, right? Don't we see it? They don't rejoice in the well-being of this man. Instead of peace and tranquility, which you think would be the result, this neighborhood is thrown into fear and chaos. They ask Jesus to leave. They, it's not even strong enough. Mark tells us they begged Jesus to leave. If you read this story carefully, there's one other group that begs Jesus to leave. It's the demons. Just like the demons, they beg Jesus, leave us alone. Again, it's time to look in the mirror. It's a hard look. Is it possible we see ourselves in this kind of community? Families. Neighborhoods, all communities need a scapegoat, don't they? All communities need a scapegoat. We all need a person or a group of people to point the finger at as the problem, right? Someone who bears the blame for everyone else and by comparison helps us to feel better about ourselves. And having someone to blame allows us not to have to deal with our own demons, our own baggage, our own lack of health. It enables us to ignore the log in our own eye because we're so busy lamenting the nuisance, the frustration, the threat of them. We tend to treat our bad neighbors, our scapegoats like this community does, don't we? The best we can do, right, for all of our bad neighbors is restrain them, is segregate them, right? That's why our prisons, where do we build our prisons? Far away and outside of the side of the community, that's with the homeless, the homeless, right? We're totally okay with the homeless living under the freeway where we can't see them. But all of a sudden, if they start to come out and be visible, we're not okay with that. 
And when we have the talk of low-income housing or treatment houses for addicts being built, not on my block, not in my neighborhood, right? This is a hard look. Are the undesirables, are the outsiders, aren't they our benchmark for how well we're doing? Don't we all, well, at least I'm not there. At least I'm not that guy. We need them, don't we? We need them to know we're okay, that we're doing fine. Do we really want them to get better? Do we honestly desire to see them integrated back into the neighborhood? Beloved, here's the point. This story draws out powerfully for us when we talk about loving our neighbors like Jesus. This story draws out that our lives are interconnected. We are created for community and we exist in community one way or another. On our own, apart from God's intervention, we live together divided, us versus them, united by a common enemy, a scapegoat. We find our unity in agreeing on who's to blame. But Jesus comes. The gospel is about Jesus comes to make peace not only with us, but peace between us. Jesus comes to remove the scapegoats. Jesus comes to restore the outcasts. Jesus comes to reconcile our broken neighborhoods. Jesus comes to reveal better solutions than binding and locking people up or ostracizing and segregating people from each other. And what we see in this story is Jesus does all of this. He heals us. He saves us. He reconciles us. He restores us one person at a time. Don't you see? The deliverance of the one man was intended to lead to the deliverance of the rest of the community. There was a community around this man. And that community proved to be as possessed and as broken as he was. After this man was set free and made whole, the community should have been next. But the rest of the neighborhood wouldn't accept the love, grace, and truth Jesus was offering them. Instead of embracing faith, they remained trapped, possessed by their fears. What this community failed to understand is their connection to the man who was healed. What this community failed to appreciate is loving our neighbor like Jesus isn't a one-sided deal. Loving our neighbor isn't just about our neighbor, in other words. It's about us. It affects our whole neighborhood. Don't you find it interesting that Jesus, when he tells us to love our neighbor, says to love our neighbor as ourselves? You ever wonder about that? Love your neighbor as yourself. He, doesn't, he could have just said, love your neighbor. But Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because we are inseparably linked. We are called to love our neighbor, not because it only impacts, blesses, or benefits them, but because it also impacts, blesses, benefits, and changes us. In the kingdom of God, there is no us versus them. We are one in Christ. What affects you affects me, and vice versa. We're in this together. Real community, not community in name only. Biblical community is built by people who receive, experience, and extend the liberating power of Christ. We invite Jesus to be with us. We're all about that. We want Jesus to be with us, but inviting Jesus to be with us means realizing Jesus is also for them. The rest of our neighbors, the whole of our community. To ignore, to dismiss, or perpetuate the distress of another person not only contributes to their suffering and lack of health, it also negatively affects ours. Forsaking the well-being of others is to jeopardize our own healing and restoration. When we isolate or neglect our neighbor, we suffer too. And the opposite is true. When we seek the betterment of our neighbor, we thrive also. I know I'm repeating myself, but by way of saying it one more time, on the surface, this appears to be the story of a single demonized man. But what ultimately gets revealed here is a haunted and broken neighborhood. In this encounter, Jesus comes not just to put back a man's life together, but to restore a broken community. But they'll have none of it. As possessed as this one person is by a legion of demons, this village is even more possessed by its fear, its fear of loss, its fear of change, its fear of being transformed, and so they ask Jesus to leave. Again, think about the implications of that. They ask 
Jesus to leave. They sent away their salvation. They turned their back on their means of grace, of being healed, restored, and made whole. The way this story ends, it looks like they blew it, doesn't it? Because Jesus leaves as requested, and seemingly the neighborhood remains broken, unhealed, and failed. Or does it? And this brings us to the last part of this message. The ending and its significance. The very end of this story, you, you remember at first that this delivered and transformed man seeks to go with Jesus. I love this. He seeks to go with Jesus. He wants to follow Christ, doesn't he? And, and my friends, that's the sign of salvation. That's the sign of salvation. The sign that you've been saved is your desire to be a disciple. The sign that you've been saved by Christ is your desire to be a disciple, to not just benefit from Jesus, but to learn and grow in Christ with Jesus. This guy wants to follow Jesus. But Jesus, you notice, redirects this man's desire to follow him. Instead of going with him literally into the boat, the man is told to go back to his own people and to tell them how much the Lord has done for him and how God has shown him mercy. I find this extraordinary, by the way. I find this absolutely fascinating, wonderfully extraordinary. I mean, think about this. Unlike the original 12 disciples, they've been around on this whole journey too, by the way. They've been there the whole time. Unlike the original 12 disciples who continue to need coddling and correction and attention from Jesus, this guy, a former demoniac, right, is sent immediately on an evangelistic campaign. This guy is sent to go preach the gospel. Go. Tell everyone how much God has done for you. Tell them, tell them how God has shown you mercy. And what's beautiful as you read this ending carefully is Jesus may have granted the community's wish for him to leave, yeah? But Jesus does not leave them without a lifeline. Another chance to be healed and made whole. The seeds of salvation continue to be sown not only in this village, if you read it carefully, but all around the cities of the Decapolis through the words and witness of the one who was once branded the village idiot, the town scapegoat. Everyone tells us at the end of this passage, everyone, Mark says, was amazed. My friends, don't miss that. The most powerful and persuasive evidence of the gospel is a life transformed by Jesus Christ. The most powerful and persuasive evidence of the gospel is a life transformed by Christ. This community, this village in the story and the wider region is profoundly impact and changed despite all their fears. How do I know that? How do I know that? If you have your Bible open, jump with me to Mark chapter 7 verse 31. If you don't have your Bible open, don't worry, I'm going to tell you what it is. You skip ahead in Mark to Mark chapter 7 verse 31 and you read this verse. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. Meaning, Jesus eventually returns to this region again, traveling by land instead of by boat. He comes back to the Decapolis, to this region, this network of 10 Gentile cities, Greek in religion and culture, predominantly Roman in population now. If you have your Bible open, you jump now a paragraph to the beginning of chapter 8, and if you look at the beginning of chapter 8, there's a subheading there, a title of this section. And the title of that section is The Feeding of the 4,000. Mark 8, verse 1 actually says, During those days, a large crowd gathered. Why did a large crowd gather? Mark tells us, because they had heard Jesus was coming. If you're tracking with me, here's my question for you. Where and why did all these Gentiles come from? From Jesus' reputation, certainly. But I'm going to argue a large portion of this sizable crowd, more than 4,000 is gathered to see Jesus because of what they heard he did along the seashore of the Gerasenes. People came, in other words, thanks to the living testimony of a changed man. The demoniac turned disciple. The guy who, after being delivered, started delivering the gospel in his own backyard. Do you see that? From Jesus, please leave, to 4,000, Jesus, feed us. We have this expression, right? It takes a village. You've heard that before, right? It takes a village. Well, this story demonstrates sometimes it takes a neighbor to transform the neighborhood. 
In the transformation of one life resides the seeds for the redemption of the whole community. My friends, we love our neighbor like Jesus when we refuse to leave our neighbor behind. Jesus puts lives back together in order to bring communities back together. My healing and restoration are inseparably linked together to yours and vice versa. The smallest, most insignificant, out of control or annoying neighbor that we're ignoring or overlooking might just be the very person, the very key through whom Jesus is going to transform and change us. To encounter the grace, love, and truth of Jesus, to follow Christ is to be sent back into the neighborhood, back into our community where we live and breathe most of the time and to share him, to extend the health, the wholeness, the abundant and full life we receive from him. In a world predominated by insecurity and doubt that creeps into the intimate circles of our communities, Jesus has delivered us to be a different kind of legion a legion of disciples speaking faith and offering humble service in order to silence the demons of fear and set all the captives free. Our primary mission field is always right in our own backyard. If we can't be vocal and tell others about how much God has done for us there, where else will we? Amen.